An orgy of bloodletting in a fortnight has left behind a trail of despair. Last week, a young lady, Maria Nagirinya, alongside her driver, were kidnapped and killed. The police has a sketchy photo of the suspect on CCTV. There are fears that he could have slipped through a dragnet and fled across the porous border outlets. Barely before the country could come to terms with her death, and as investigators poured over the details of what transpired, killers struck again. In Liantonde district, a family of three was killed as those involved fled the scene without stealing anything. The motive here appears to be clear. Earlier on in the night, a young man, Joshua Rushejera Ntereho, and a lady, Melina Tumukunde, were killed on Entebbe Expressway. The circumstances of the killing, the sophistication, and the final trip into a trap all make the plot murky. Who wanted him dead and why? The two directors of criminal investigations and our forensics uh, managed to revisit the scene this morning. Up to now, they are still there. They have reconstructed the scene for further uh, documentation. Although at this stage, the clear motivation surrounding the double murder is not yet, uh, is not yet established. Who are those behind the threats he received before he was killed? Why was his security not boosted, yet he has closed ties to the establishment? According to police, Ntaireho implored his friend, police officer, Davis Taremwa, who was on duty at Hidden Treasure Hotel in Entebbe, to escort him to Millennium Hotel in Zana shortly before he was killed. It's not clear yet why Taremwa was left behind. Did another person emerge from the vicinity and drive the car till the bridge where the shooting incident occurred? There's a bit of a puzzle in there because uh, our officer, whom we have... Uh, obtained uh, a, uh, an inquiry statement from indicates that when they reached Millennium, uh, the Joshua asked him to go and call uh, Suvi Robert from inside the hotel so that they can uh, get to uh, have their transaction uh, conducted. And of course, he says when he was inside trying to trace for Suvi, he came out and found when Joshua and Florence had driven off together with his gun inside the, the, the headdress. Of course, it is not something that we can believe. It appears is a bit evasive. Ntaireho was found clutching an AK-47 and his corpse was outside the car. There's nothing suggesting that probably, which means the driver took time to get to stop the vehicle and it was Joshua who was driving uh, that vehicle. So. There's nothing to show that probably he was just taken by surprise uh, uh, and so on because there are no, uh, uh, there are no, uh, there, there, there is no evidence showing any form of skidding or uh, maybe uh, diverting from, uh, from, the, from, the st from the steering and, and, and so on. So uh, he came to a complete halt. Now, the, what we want to determine is uh, uh, basically at what stage did this shooting occur? Did it occur from within the, uh, the vehicle after an altercation? Is it uh, uh, a transaction which went bad or is it a drive-along shooting? Barely before he was shot, did he leave the car to confront the killer? Was the gun used in the shooting, the one belonging to Tarem? recovered three spent cartridges, which means that three bullets uh, were shot. They recovered the, uh, a magazine, which had uh, uh, 27 bullets unspent, so, uh, which means these other three spent cartridges uh, com composed uh, the 30 bullets in the, in the full magazine of the AK-47. The shooting precision on the forehead also suggests that this was a skilled assassin who wanted to Mukunde, who appears to have been shot from inside the car dead, or was she collateral damage? There is no evidence to show that there was any form of fire exchange, maybe from a third party at this stage as we talk. Uh, the evidence so far uh, indicates that the 
the fire exchange was from, there was no fire exchange. These are gunshots that came from a single, uh, a single gun. So that is how our, our, our inquiries are actually progressing. The spot where they were shot appears to have been carefully chosen. A few meters away from the CCTV camera, it's an isolated stretch and on either side is a floating swamp. How did the killer or killers escape? Did they go through the cut barbed wire on the roadside to flee to safety? What they basically wanted was to see if at all there was any form of drive away vehicle or a border border to help uh, establish probably if it was a drive along shooting like what has been occurring. So uh, they tried to uh, uh, to you know, block all exit routes from Entebbe, uh, and uh, of course it didn't yield anything. Tumukunde was married to Mark Rugenza. NTV has learned that on Tuesday she and her husband attended the burial of the late Supreme Court Justice Alfred Karokora in Imbarara. Rugenza left for Kampala and the wife remained in Imbarara. It's not clear yet how he learned of her death, which he claims came as a shock as he expected her to be in Imbarara. According to sources, Ntaireo worked at Civil Aviation Authority in the airports and aviation security section. He resigned last year to start a money lending business. With growing success, he opted to expand his business to Kampala. Close family members who spoke off the record claimed that he was being trailed and sent death threats prior to his killing. He instructed his family not to directly contact him for fear of placing them in harm's way. Could this be part of a nefarious plot by sleeper cells who have a clear pattern aimed at destabilizing the country or are these incidents an indicator of a rise in violent crime? Yusuf Serunkuma, a PhD student at Makere Institute for Social Research, fears that these shootings are not isolated offenses of crime, but well planned and they foreshadow what will happen in the near future. Uh, the only way to think about these very sophisticated, non-materially interested killings is through the lens of what this government has been selling to Ugandans. The best item, product that government sold to Ugandan was security. <clears throat> now anyone who is interested in crippling this government will focus, will have to look at what it is best product. If security is the product government is selling to Ugandans, then if you, you, you run through security, you actually expose government. I think. Uh, it could be a stretch to say now, but it seems systematic that this looks like it's an affront on the government of President Seveni. Security agencies are also under the spotlight. In the ruthless world of cloak and dagger games, friends may turn into enemies. Afandi Chidomida have told us over and over again, over and over again, that I'm a target for murder. Now, Chidomida is security himself, all right? And he was taken out. Another soldier, Major Chigundu, on radio, the audio circulated after he had been murdered, it circulated when he said, I am a target for murder. He got murdered. The Muslim scholars, in their many numbers, all of them came out and said, we are going to be murdered. They were murdered. Now, that level of sophistication, Afande Kaihura, when he was, when he was IGP, he came out and said, <coughs> We know the murderers in this country. We know they are operating security sleeper cells in this, in this town. And we are going to go after them. Nothing happened. All right. And if you remember the amount of ammunition and the quality of execution in the way uh, Afandi Kawish was taken out, those are not ordinary human beings. They're so close to power and they live among us. The president had earlier on suggested that the installation of CCTV cameras could help stamp out these crimes. But with a tongue of loose ends in investigations, speculation and conspiracy theories clogging the vacuum, the masterminds are growing emboldened that they continue to pull off such daring crimes. They know certain security detail. They can track phone calls. They can update their victims of what is going on. They, they are inside the police establishment, so they know. From the so many matters we've had, we've seen that people actually know what they're dealing with. You made a phone call to the president and we had you make the phone call. Please don't call the president again. Somebody who is as sophisticated as being able to track the president's phone call 
is not on the outside. He has to be from inside. The question is how can the state stamp out this threat which threatens its legitimacy? From the very beginning, the biggest product that the government of President Museveni sold to Ugandans in 1986 was security. Sleep. All right? Okweba Kotulo. That was the big thing that this government sold to Ugandans. And you know, you could call it a tragic flower. It's their biggest asset and it could be their biggest downfall. In giving security to Ugandans, they multiply themselves into so many wings. They are incredibly many wings that you don't even know. Our security establishment, for example, if you look at the police, the police has been taken over by this, uh, the military. You have CMI, you have JAT, you have, you have ESO, you have GISO, you have all those many names. Now, in their enthusiasm to provide security to Ugandans at those so many fronts, they have become confused and uncoordinated. Now, at the same time, Many of them are hawking security to the president. Like they are, they are, they are, it's one of the ways they make money as individuals. Emmanuel Mutaizibwa, NTV.